started. Welcome to the target Discover How to Buy Accessible IT. We are very pleased to have with us today Corinne Weibel, the Deputy Project Director from our good friends at Pete. This is our second, second of many, I hope, collaborations together today. Um, if you didn't know what it stands for, it's on the slide. It's the Partnership on Employment and Accessible Technology. I'm sure Corinne will tell you all about their wonderful program. And so I do not want to get in the way. So with that being said, I will turn things over to Corinne. Thank you so much, Paul. It is wonderful to be back here. And uh, we're really excited to be uh, giving a sneak peek to a resource that we'll be unveiling in the next few weeks um, called BiIT, which uh, is the main subject of this talk today and is all about how uh, you actually deal with the nuts and bolts of actually buying and working with vendors to make sure that the ICT that you um, are looking <clears throat> are looking to purchase and implement is accessible to everybody, including people with disabilities. Uh, I'm going to start out just giving a little background um, to Pete, who we are and what we do. Uh, up on screen, uh, I have a screenshot of our website. It's p e a t w o r k s dot o r g, and we are an initiative to foster collaboration and action around accessible technology in the workplace. Um, I'd like to start out uh, just by showing a short video of um, giving a, a quick introduction to the things that we work on. Um, let's see, it might take a moment to get up. <laughs> Just a moment.
Okay. <laughs> Thanks so much, Paul. So, um, yeah, as, as the video um, went through, we uh, exist to help employers um, learn and understand why it pays to build and buy accessible technology in the workplace. Um, we're an initiative that started um, a few years ago, about four years ago now. And um, a core part of our mission is looking at the employment life cycle. Um, which up on screen, I've got um, a chart showing how accessible technology fits into every phase of the employment life cycle today. Um, that starts with recruiting, um, and that's actually where a lot of our initial work focused, um, especially job applications, um, the kind of surveys you have to fill out before uh, an employer um, offers you a job officially. Uh, the hiring and onboard process tends to involve a lot of uh, online resources as well. And of course, this is in every phase. It's in when on the job, everybody relies on technology. And, um, and it, that's included in you know even post-employment like um, applications, like how people access their retirement benefits. So this has been a growing need for many years. And today, I think everybody would agree that technology is a really crucial part of all of our lives. And in order to ensure that everybody has equal access, um, accessibility is a big part of that. And of course, from the employer perspective, it's what um, they need to invest in in order to um, recruit and retain top talent. So, um, and I, I should mention today that uh, our, our materials tend to be geared at a wide audience, um, including both private employers and the federal sector. Um, I'm guessing most of the audience today um, and uh, afterwards will be the federal audience, so I'll try to address that specifically, but uh, our materials are for everybody. So, and just to run through a few of the, the broader things we do, um, we do a lot of interviews with people in the field. Um, we have a lot of video resources. Up on screen right now, I've got a video conversation we did with a number of folks uh, answering the question, if you were riding in an elevator with a Fortune 500 CEO, what's your pitch for why implementing accessible technology matters? Um, so we got a wide range of perspectives from the private sector. We had someone from Ernst & Young, someone um, from Canon USA, someone from uh, the state of Minnesota, um, all, all giving a, a perspective on why that business case can be made. Um, we also have uh, action steps for employers, and this uh, really walks you through the basics of how to set up your accessibility initiatives and what kinds of policies you can think about um, in terms of your whole department or company. Um, and um, another thing, um, probably some of our first efforts uh, focused on this 2015 report on e-recruiting, um, which was about job uh, um, application accessibility. And the key takeaway there was 46% in a national survey we did with people with disabilities um, of people that we asked about their last experience of job online, of applying to a job online, 46% said it was difficult to impossible, um, which of course um, was, you know, actually not super surprising to us given a lot of uh, the initial interviews we did. But um, it's, a, it's a major problem, obviously. Um, so we developed TalentWorks, which is um, a resource guide on our site um, explaining why e-recruiting and technology are linked today and why these processes have to be accessible, that a lot of employers are unintentionally, obviously, um, keeping a lot of top like their top candidates potentially out of consideration. A lot of people are not even necessarily able to apply to a job. Um, so this is a great resource that walks you through a lot of um, the benefits of accessible technology and how to get started um, with all the different steps. And it's great. Uh, we, it is geared towards e-recruiting tools, but um, 
the lessons in it are pretty broadly applicable to any stage of the employment life cycle. Uh, we also have policy matters, which um, walks you through laws, regulations, um, kind of any, uh, any part of the regulatory landscape that involves accessible workplace technology. Um, Section 508 is obviously um, of prime <laughs> interest to um, the federal sector. And, and I'll be talking a lot more about that as well. Um, but uh, it's a great place to look into things like the Section 508 re um, refresh uh, that took a place last year and takes effect this January. Um, a, lot, a lot of big changes are coming, and uh, there's uh, a big transition going on right now. Um, so uh, it's, uh, we've got a gr great resources. And we also have a benchmarking tool called TechCheck, uh, which helps you run through and get a like just a snapshot of how uh, advanced your you are in your initiative towards accessibility. Uh, it's a great way to get a sense of where you're at, what you might not be thinking about, um, what kind of policies or program development um, you should be thinking about putting into place. Um, and this is a great um, tool. We've got gotten some great feedback that people use it uh, as justification with um, people higher up when um, as justification for why an accessibility initiative is needed, why uh, resources should be put towards this goal. Um, but today I'll be, uh, I'll be talking about BIIT, um, which is our new tool in response to a lot of feedback we've gotten from people who are really on board with the idea that they absolutely want to be buying accessible technology that everybody can use. But the process of working with vendors and making sure something is accessible when you're not an expert in that field can be a really complicated process. Uh, so this tool is intended to help really guide you through that whole process and uh, help you really understand how to do it. Uh, this is not up on our site yet. Today I'll be doing a sneak peek, um, but uh, we hope to have it up in the next few weeks um, because we'll be launching it um, in, uh, in honor of National uh, Disability Employment Awareness Month, which is October. So up on screen, I've got a chart that goes through uh, the accessible procurement life cycle. And this has three major stages, planning, solicitation, and post-award. Um, you'll see the f in planning, we have the first two steps, which are setting procurement priorities and preparing to buy. Uh, the second major phase is solicitation. Uh, that's issuing your solicitation. Um, and then once you've gotten those back from vendors, evaluating the proposals and their VPATs. And then um, the third phase is post-award, after you've chosen a, a, a vendor. Uh, that includes negotiating contracts, testing and evaluation, managing performance and relationships, and reviewing and learning. So I'll be walking you through each of these phases. And of course, we will have a lot more details up on the site very soon, but uh, hoping to give you a general sense of um, this process and how to get started. So um, step one, uh, the very beginning, uh, is generally gaining executive support for accessible procurement. And uh, to do that, um, that generally involves making the business case to people higher up about why this is a worthy investment. <clears throat> and there are several great arguments you can make. Um, the first is accessible technology fuels productivity. And, uh, you know, this is true both you know, for people with disabilities and without. Um, a lot of people with disabilities don't necessarily identify that way, but one in five Americans do have them. And, <clears throat> of course, it's a really important thing to keep in mind with an aging workforce. Um, but 
you know, people with disabil without disabilities also benefit generally by investing in accessible technology. And that's because accessible technology overlaps quite a lot with usability in general. Um, <clears throat> uh, a good example of this is something like uh, Siri on an iPhone. You know, voiceover technologies make it possible to work without your hands. And that's really useful, even if you do have full use of your hands, that ability. Um, and obviously, the general population really benefits a lot in a lot of ways. Um, I can say I often use it um, just kind of casually if I'm like taking a walk or if I need to be taking notes while also participating, like but while also working. Um, it also can help, you know, someone who's injured on the job. Um, like last summer, I had injured my right hand for a few weeks, and because I had voiceover technologies built into my computer and phone, that really effect didn't affect my productivity at all. So it's a great thing to keep in mind in general, and um, I think the rise of mobile technologies also de demonstrates, you know, you, you see a lot of customization and how much people benefit from that and how productive they are. So a great thing to keep in mind generally. Uh, beyond that, other arguments, it's less expensive to buy the right product the first time. If you buy a product and then one of your employees is unable to use it because it's not accessible, that can be really expensive um, to the remediation process, um, trying to figure it, like once, once something is already implemented, it's a lot harder to fix after the fact. Another argument uh, is that implementing accessible ICT mitigates legal risk. <clears throat> and of course, that's very important for everybody in the federal sector or for vendors um, creating things for federal clients. Um, because of Section 508, all of this technology is required to be accessible. And uh, there's also some, like just generally, um, although um, I know a lot of our, our, our audience today is federal, but um, there's a lot of evidence coming out of the Department of Justice. Um, they've had many rulings demonstrating that digital access is covered under the Americans with Disabilities Act as well. And that applies to all public websites and um, all websites that are federally or, or generally state and local. Um, so other arguments, accessibility leads to improved and expanded recruitment. Um, accessibility boosts employee retention. And accessibility can foster workplace diversity. And of course, this is all about both um, attracting top talent that may benefit from this kind of technology um, or need, need it to be productive workers, and also retaining the workers you have. Um, and again, an aging workforce Accessible technology can, can often mean that people can continue working um, even if um, they develop a disability as part of the aging process. So, uh, and we've got a lot more resources uh, along these lines on the site, especially within TalentWorks. Um, a lot about the return on investment, including some great video resources. So if you're looking to make these arguments, I uh, definitely recommend that. Uh, the second part of step one is planning out your procurement strategy. Um, and probably, you know, the first thing to think about is who your target users are. And when thinking about your target users, you don't, you want to avoid the process, the mistake of thinking about the average user, which is a really dated idea. Um, today, um, with keeping in mind what a, the, a good user experience is. Um, designers are designing for the extremes. They're thinking about kind of the top 10 percent and the the bottom 10 percent, and you know what those more extreme needs are. And by designing with those in mind, you, you, the middle takes care of itself uh, because there is no average user. We're all individuals. We all. We all have really unique needs. So by designing for the extremes, you include everybody. Secondly, um, you want to determine your technical standards and what you need to comply with. Uh, again, as I've mentioned, uh, if you um, 
work for the, the federal government, uh, anything you're doing must comply with Section 508 of the Rehabilitation Act. This is required for federal U.S. agencies uh, or for vendors selling to the federal government. And uh, because of the recent Section 508 refresh, ICT covered by Section 508 must now also conform to the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. Um, they've been harmonized to WCAG 2.0 Level A and Level AA. And the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines are a global standard um, put together by the Web Accessibility Initiative. Um, it's a voluntary compliance and is specifically for web content, not uh, ICT in general. But um, as the Section 508 refresh shows, um, there have been some great efforts in general to harmonize these standards generally. And related to that is also EN301549, um, which is probably not super relevant itself to most of the audience today because it's the European standard. Uh, in the U.S., it is voluntary, and public agencies are not required to comply. Uh, however, it's noteworthy that it is also developed to be in close harmony with Section 508. And generally, vendors um, are working to comply with all three of these standards today because most of them are selling in the global marketplace. Uh, so the next step beyond that is defining your purchasing needs, and that starts with conducting a comprehensive review of your company's business requirements and overall purchasing needs, uh, particularly when you can consolidate efforts. And um, as you assemble and educate your purchasing team, um, you want to make sure you're drawing from everyone across the organization. Uh, that includes representatives from IC IT, policy, finance, operations, legal, programs, and procurement. Um, and as you develop procurement policies, um, it's a lot to get into now, but there are some great guides out there. Uh, the number one that we would rec recommend, especially for this audience, is that GSA has put together a technology accessibility playbook, which is a wonderful guide for really working through what kind of policies you can develop that will pay off long term. Uh, the global organization G3ICT also has a great guide. They, it's called A Guide to Adopting Accessibility Procurement Policy. Also really great advice in there. And uh, one that I forgot to put on the slide but will also mention um, is that there's been some great work in general from states um, and uh, on the NASIO website, nascio.org, um, you'll find a lot of resources related to what they call policy-driven adoption for accessibility, or PDAA. Um, so those are great resources when you're working through this stage. Uh, after step one, we have step two, which is preparing to buy. And this is really the research phase. So um, probably the majority of the buying that you're going to do is going to be commercial off-the-shelf products. And so when you're starting out this process of researching with vendors, uh, the first thing that you can do is to ask for a VPAT, uh, which we're, we'll talk about a lot more. <laughs> but that's the main way that people often communicate with vendors. Um, about accessibility guidelines, like how accessible their product is. This form um, is part of Section 508 and uh, figuring out what is complies. So a lot of vendors um, will generally, especially if they sell to the federal government a lot, um, generally have this available. And if they don't, it can be uh, possibly a warning sign um, that they might be new to accessibility. Um, the other thing you can um, look to see is their WCAG conformance statements. And again, that's the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. Um, and they will generally have these for their corporate website, relevant products, and other websites they've developed. The other big thing to figure out immediately is to know who you're talking with. Um, it, ideally, um, you would be talking with the original equipment manufacturer uh, or the OEM. And that's because they're the folks that will generally have the most control and knowledge about how 
accessible the products are, and what the plans are to make them more accessible. Like if there are issues, if there are workarounds, if they are planning to make a big fix in the next year. Uh, they're the ones that are easiest to work with in general. Uh, which isn't to say that a company further along in the value chain wouldn't know this. Um, but if you are working with a value-added reseller, um, you just be aware that uh, of their role and that they may not themselves have very much um, ability to make fixes if there are accessibility issues. So resources to check out in this phase. Um, BuyAccessible.gov is a wonderful resource. Uh, the Buy Accessible Wizard allows you to input uh, information about what you're looking for, your requirements, and it'll give you some really targeted feedback about what kind, what you need to look for to make sure that you will be complying with Section 508. A few others that are also great, uh, the Global Accessibility Reporting Initiative, uh, or GARI for short, uh, has great information. Uh, it's a database for mobile devices uh, explaining their accessibility capabilities. And the FCC also has an accessibility clearinghouse um, for a lot of products um, and uh, helps you figure out if a product you're interested in is accessible or um, figure out what kind, like if you're looking for something that will fit the role you need, it's a great place to look. So for researching a custom product, um, that can be a little more complicated. And then you really want to do your homework on figuring out if the developer you're working with has a background in accessibility. Um, so you can check that out on their website or on sites such as LinkedIn. And some of the things to look for, um, a formal accessibility or usability statement for their website um, is a great start. That's one of the most basic things that people um, do from an accessibility perspective. It's generally linked on the bottom of their home page. And if they don't have one, it may be a warning sign that accessibility is not something they're too familiar with. Another thing to look for is our staff backgrounds and skills in accessibility training or expertise. So um, one thing you can look for is involvement with the International Association of Accessibility Professionals, which is um, a global certification in accessibility. Uh, and if they have that, that's wonderful. If they don't, it's not necessarily a problem. It is a pretty new certification. And a lot of people um, that have wonderful knowledge and skills with accessibility don't necessarily have that. But uh, if they've made contributions to the Web Accessibility Initiative, um, that's a great sign. If they've participated in events like Accessibility Camp or hackathons related to accessibility, uh, they may have a GitHub profile that mentions accessibility proje projects. Or they may have been involved at conferences that are accessibility focused, such as the CSUN Assistive Technology Conference, the M Enabling Summit and Accessing High and Ground are just a few of the big ones. And another thing you can look for is a social media presence that mentions accessibility. One tip here is that uh, the term accessibility on the web is often shortened to A11Y, um, which uh, looks visually kind of like ally and is also uh, shorthand for accessibility because it's an 11-letter term that people were tired of <laughs> spelling out. But um, that A11Y is often used as a hashtag. So step two, preparing to buy, also includes issuing a request for proposals or an RFP. So the RFP and the sources sought, um, if you're using it, uh, government agencies generally do, collect written information about the capabilities of various suppliers. Some benefits to the RFP are that you may discover new companies that you hadn't previously researched. And it also helps you define your requirements. Um, you can lay out some initial requirements. And it may help you continue to build those out. And the key part of this phase from an accessibility perspective is that you include your accessibility requirements in your RFI um, and RFP and ask really specific questions about their experience in developing, testing, and implementing accessible products. 
Uh, and that's really critical because then you're communicating that accessibility is going to be an important requirement from the beginning. And you're going to attract the kind of vendors that work on that and will be able to help you succeed in that area. And again, uh, Buy Accessible is great in this way. Uh, they've got a great quick tips tool that helps you get specific with the kind of language you should be using to find the right vendor. Uh, and then, uh, of course, you'll meet with vendors. Uh, one way to do that is to host an industry day event at your facility uh, to engage in conference calls, or you can tour vendor facilities. And uh, the federal acquisition regulations encourage the, the exchange of information between potential offerers and the government after issuing an RFI. So in this phase, some topics to cover. Uh, you want to talk about technical standards. Um, again, probably Section 508 is the big one. But um, you know, WCAG is so harmonized that that's important, too. Uh, you can ask the vendor what types of similar products and services they've provided in the past. You can ask for references um, for clients who can attest to their accessibility expertise. You can ask for sample solicitations. And you can also ask for a demo of their product's accessibility features. So uh, of course, in determining your solicitation type, um, probably you'll be using these all if you're coming from the federal perspective. Um, but the request for information uh, would occur prior to the RFP and mainly helps you to shorten your list of suppliers. Uh, a request for proposal is a document that solicita solicits proposals from prospective bidders. They are often used when the request requires technical expertise, special, specialized capability, or when the product or service being requested does not yet exist. So this is uh, the approach you want when you know you have a problem, but you don't quite know what the solution is. Um, and a request for quote invites suppliers to bid on specific products or services. Um, this is more an approach uh, for when you know what you want and you know what companies are capable of providing it, but you're looking for more detailed pricing information. And this also often comes after an RFP, uh, when you've got a shortlisted um, list of vendors um, who can then provide more detailed price quotes. As mentioned before, um, the Buy Accessible Wizard is a really excellent resource for defining requirements. So I really recommend that everyone use it. We recommend this widely even to people that are not government buyers, because it provides a lot of just great targeted language to use in the solicitation, including some recommended evaluation criteria. Uh, and again, you can go to buyaccessible.gov. And that has the wizard along with some other really great um, tools and best practices. So step three is issuing your solicitation. And that's the writing phase. So unsurprisingly, uh, we recommend making accessibility a real front and center requirement. And the way to do that is to weave accessibility requirements throughout the RFP so that vendors know that you take it seriously. Um, and you know, one part of this um, that can be easy to overlook is making your solicitation documents fully accessible themselves. And uh, on a practical note, um, a lot of the vendors you may be looking, you know, people working there may have um, disabilities, they may need accessibility features, um, but it's a really good pra best practice in general, of course, for everything, but uh, also communicates that you make it a serious priority. So um, you can, again, use um, actionable procurement language. Um, beyond Buy Accessible, the Buy ICT for All portal by um, G3 ICT also features toolkits, training resources, and other supporting documents. And, um, it, and too specific to the technical standard that you need. And of course, um, in the writing phase, you also want to make sure that you are including all the people involved on your purchasing team. Um, 
so that you get um, all the diverse perspectives that you should be considering. As to where to address accessibility in your solicitation, um, again, you're going to be weaving this throughout the solicitation and not just buried in the fine print. So it should definitely make an appearance in sections such as background and scope and approach. And then, of course, um, for the main section you want it in, in addition to those, is a dedicated su subsection under the requirements about accessibility specifically. And questions and instructions you can include, may include, um, is your product or service fully compliant with Section 508 functional performance criteria for both administrators and end users? And how is this determination made? You can also ask them to describe their accessibility conformance testing process. Uh, a big one is, who will cover the costs of remediating any necessary fixes after purchase? So if something is determined to not be accessible after you purchase it, will they pay to fix it, or will they expect you to pay? Um, so that's a very important point. And uh, we have uh, language in a bit that I'll get to about the, um, the contract section. Then uh, there's the Voluntary Product Accessibility Template, the VPAT. You'll definitely want to request that. And then um, do you have a remediation roadmap if a product is not fully accessible. And for maintenance renewals, um, you also want to include a requirement for an accessibility review of the product. So, uh, and then evaluation criteria, as I mentioned, um, the tools mentioned before give you some great language about evaluation criteria. Um, and we on the site, we'll be including some sample model solicitation language and a sample remediation roadmap. So uh, the VPAT. Again, as I mentioned, this is probably the single most important document in this, this whole process. Because a VPAT provides a checklist of the Section 508 provisions with spaces for the vendor to indicate how well the product complies, along with notes and comments. Uh, it really is. Uh, the primary way that vendors and buyers communicate about accessibility, even for people in the private sector. And this is an exciting year for VPATs because, uh, because of the Section 508 refresh, uh, the makers of the VPAT, ITIC, will be releasing a version 2.0 that is in line with these new standards. The beta is available now, uh, and it's expected to be ready in January. Uh, 2018, which is when Section 508 refresh standards take effect. And it's very noteworthy because it contains a lot of significant changes that take into account uh, all of the technical standards I mentioned before. And it will also be a bigger document. So uh, for more information about this, you can visit the Section 508.gov update page, because they've developed a lot of information and resources for this transition. And uh, we at Pete are also happen to be having a webinar about VPATs tomorrow at 2 p.m. It's called How and Why to Make VPATs a Priority. Uh, we have seats available, so I definitely encourage you to sign up if you're interested in learning more about that. And um, that will involve <coughs> uh, two presenters from the company Elsevier talking about why they have found it to be so profitable, to make a real priority, to make very clear VPATs, and how they have woven accessibility policies throughout their organization to make sure that it is a priority. So uh, the remediation roadmap, as mentioned before, Pete does provide a sample copy. But you can also um, ask vendors to, um, like, the, uh, the main content is asking vendors to list known accessibility issues that the VPAT has found, and what is their actual plan and timeline for remediating those problems. So this would contain an issue description to list out the major accessibility issues and what gaps there are with uh, the WCAG functional performance criteria, the gaps from the VPAT, or any other evaluation from like maybe a third party or other product support. Uh, you'll want to know the current status. Is this open? Have they resolved it? Is it in progress? Then disposition, 
Um, do they actively plan to resolve it? Or do they have no active plans at this time? Are they currently investigating? And uh, this is also a great way to learn about available workarounds. They may be able to offer recommendations for things like third-party products that could help you solve this prob problem until full remediation. So moving on to step five, uh, negotiating contracts with selected vendors. So um, once you've found your vendor, um, when you're looking at the contract, you'll want to ensure that you're putting in some procurement language to clearly spell out your accessibility requirements to the vendor. Uh, Pete does provide uh, model procurement language on our site. And this sample language includes four sections. The first um, is that you want to specify that ICT, ICT products or services furnished under the contract must be accessible to and usable by individuals with disabilities consistent with federal and state laws. So and this includes a safe harbor uh, that the contractor will be considered to satisfy the accessibility requirement if it meets the functional performance criteria specified in WCAG 2.0. Uh, the second point is that the contractor must maintain and retain full documentation of measures they've taken to ensure compliance with the accessibility criteria, including any tests and simulations that they have conducted. Number three is probably the most important, and I mentioned it before, that you want the contractor to agree to remediate, um, namely to repair or replace, any non-compliant products or services. If they've agreed to give you an accessible product, you want to be able to ensure that they are contractually obligated to fix the problem if it turns out that it isn't working. And uh, the fourth section defines the term ICT. And as I mentioned before, you can find the specific model procurement language to copy right on the PEAT website. And that uh, is actually currently published in another section. So step six is acceptance, testing, and evaluation. And this is a step that often ends up being skipped, and it really shouldn't be. Um, acceptance tests are formal tests conducted by the customer upon delivery of the product. And these best practices of testing will help you avoid getting stuck with a product that's not fully accessible. As mentioned before, the last thing you want is to have invested in a new product and to find out later on that employees aren't able to use them because um, that can end up really costly and even if, um, if not, it will certainly be inefficient. You want to make sure that before it's implemented, you've already figured, you've already confirmed that it is truly accessible. So the first part of that is embracing comprehensive testing. Uh, there are a lot of great automated tools out there that are a great starting point when determining if something is accessible, but you absolutely want to be sure to include manual user testing. There is no substitute for an actual individual sitting down and testing a product. Uh, and one resource you can check out for more information about that is a PEAT um, a Pete talk that we have archived from last year with Sharon Rush of Nobility, and it's called The Importance of User Testing for Accessibility. Um, and I, I really can't emphasize enough how important that step is. Because um, you can, um, and there, yeah. So uh, the second part is incorporating scenario based testing. And with this, um, and this will help you avoid the idea of just thinking about the average user, um, you want to create persona-based test cases using a scenario model. And when you do this, you definitely want to include the possibility of differing abilities um, of many different types. And one resource um, we really recommend is that the firm Barclays has developed a great handbook of diverse personas that I have linked in the slides. Um, and it's a great way for really broadly thinking about all the different kinds of types of people that will be using your product and their individual needs and how they um, are going to be most productive when they're able to customize um, the tools that they're working with. The third thing to think about um, with acceptance testing is checking compatibility of screen readers and other assistive devices. 
And of course, that's kind of related to scenario-based testing. Um, a lot of people may be using assistive devices like screen readers, and you'll want to make sure that they are interoperable with any technology that you buy. And uh, not just screen readers, um, but um, you know, people may be using a wide range of devices that you want to be thinking that about. And uh, in this phase, another thing that can be easily overlooked is how accessible documentation and support resources are. Is the manual, you know, accessible? Uh, that kind of thing uh, can seem small, um, but is actually quite large. Um, so make sure that anything like that, whether it's the help desk or just the user manual, make sure those are accessible too. And then finally, reporting test results and remediating. And when developing a remediation plan, if you do find an accessibility issue, um, there are some great uh, resources. Um, the Texas Department of Information Resource has a really nice one, Electronic Information Resources Accessibility Implementation Remedi Remediation Plan. And there's also a great 508 Web Compliance and Remediation Framework that HHS um, has published. So those are really great um, kind of templates and guides to working with that issue with your vendor. Uh, then step seven. Um, following that, managing performance and relationships. And, uh, you know, it's and this is really about communication with your vendor that's ongoing. Because by developing a collaborative relationship with the technology providers in your circle, you can foster a two-way channel of communication and a commitment to ensuring accessibility over the long term. So some best practices include uh, you want to conduct periodic accessibility audits uh, of the product that you purchased. You know, sometimes there's a software update or something similar that can affect accessibility issues. Uh, so that's a great regular practice to do. You can also request ongoing IT management details from the vendor. So, um, some products require certain administrative settings or add-ons in order for the accessibility features to be activated, for example. And a lot of times, those instructions aren't actually in the manual. Um, you will, but if you talk to um, the actual folks, uh, like the actual vendor, they may have that knowledge and can pass that on. You can also ask the vendor how other customers are offering help desk and related support to their users with disabilities. And you can also stay in touch about what accessibility improvements will be found in the next release of their product. And of course, um, that's a great thing to know ahead of time because it can fit into future purchasing negotiations and remediation plans too. So um, yeah, and over time, building a, collaborate, a collaborative relationship like this will mean that you get the best service and also helps to communicate that you really value accessibility. And hearing that from their clients does tend to make vendors make it more of a priority themselves. Uh, and finally, the last step is reviewing and learning. And the goal of this phase um, is to infuse an accessibility mindset into all procurements across your organization. Uh, often, this means conducting an accessibility assessment of all the technology within your workplace and looking for ways to share your newfound knowledge about accessible ICT procurements with colleagues and vendors. So a lot of the PEAT resources I mentioned previously are geared towards this more um, overarching effort towards um, promoting accessibility within your organization. Tech Check, as I mentioned before, is a benchmarking tool that helps you assess the accessibility of your workplace technologies and will also assist you in finding tools to develop them further. Our Accessible Technology Action Steps is a guide um, that really roadmaps um, ensuring that the technology in your workplace is accessible to all employees, including those with disabilities. And finally, our TalentWorks tool um, is geared towards e-recruiting. It's um, written for human resource professionals and employers to help them ensure that their online job applications and other technologies for e-recruiting are accessible to job seekers with disabilities. 
But as I mentioned before, it also has some great resources and advice for, for any kind of policies or um, efforts uh, at any stage of the uh, employment life cycle. So uh, before um, I close, I also just want to again reiterate that Pete is holding a webinar tomorrow called How and Why to Make VPATS a Priority. And it's with Elsevier. And they'll be discussing the, belt, the business significance of VPATS, VPATS and their best practices for handling requests. And that's tomorrow at 2 PM Eastern Time. And you can register at p-e-a-t-w-o-r-k-s dot o-r-g. If you scroll down to our, our events section, you'll see the registration link. Uh, if you enjoyed today's presentation, we also encourage you to stay in touch by signing up for our newsletter. Uh, we provide a lot of related resources around uh, buying and implementing accessible technology, including free webinars, articles, um, news, just kind of any anything connected to this topic. And uh, this newsletter uh, will help you stay in touch with those efforts. Uh, we're also pretty active on social media. Our Twitter handle is at P-E-A-T-W-O-R-K-S. And we're also on Facebook at, at the same handle. And uh, we would love to engage you in the conversations taking place on either platform. And finally, uh, you can reach us directly at info at peatworks.org. Our website is p-e-a-t-w-o-r-k-s dot o-r-g, peatworks dot org. And uh, you can download today's presentation. Uh, it looks like you've got a link directly on the Target website. But you can also download it on our site at the link above, which is peteworks.org slash content slash discover dash how dash buy dash accessible dash IT. So thank you so much. And if anyone has any questions, uh, you're welcome to type them in the questions and answers box. But um, I'll, I'll just wait a moment if anybody would like to